Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so good to see y'all here this morning. I love to hear y'all fellowship and just having a good time as the body of Christ. We are excited to come and worship our great God together. We are so uh, thrilled that you're here. If you're a guest joining us, we just want to say thank you for spending the time with us this morning to worship Almighty God. I know this is a very special day in the life of our church, in the life of many of our families, as is parent-child dedication. I know some of you are guests for that reason. Some of you are guests just to come worship with us. Just, we're not connected to any of those families, and that's okay. Either way, we're excited you're here. We do want to get to know you and just uh, be in touch with you. And so we have something called a Connect Card. They're on, located on the little table going out the double doors on your left over our Welcome Center. If you don't know where that is, just go through this door to my left, your right, hang it right down the stairs and hang another right right there, that desk there, and they're on that desk. And after the service, if you just take a moment to fill those out, there'll be someone at the desk there you can turn it in. we got a gift to say thank you for being here today. But we just want to be back in touch with you and connect with you. And certainly if you have a prayer request, please write that on there. It's our privilege to pray for you. Any questions about the church, you can write that on there, even right around on the back side of it, and we'll be in touch with you. But we're glad you're here on this very exciting day as we worship our great God together. And also, if you're joining us online, we are thankful for that opportunity. If you can't be with us in person, that you can be here with us online and worship it that way along with us. Well, as we begin, I want to share with you from Psalms 145 to kind of get our mind and heart focused on the reason we're here is to worship Almighty God. And so uh, listen to the first three verses of Psalms 145 this morning. I will extol you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. That's the God we've come to worship. We've come to extol him. We've come to bless him. We've come to praise his name because he is greatly to be praised. Just in who God is alone, he is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. And then you add in how good he is to us, we should just be overflowing with praise. And I pray that's your heart's attitude this morning as we worship Almighty God. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, we are grateful and thankful just to be here today, Lord, and we just give you praise for who you are. Father, I thank you for each person that's here. I thank you for the time we can gather as the body of Christ to worship you. We thank you for the first service, and we thank you for the families in that service that took part in child dedication. We thank you for the families in this service that are doing it, Lord. And Father, we just thank you that their heart's desire as parents is to raise their children in a way that they come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, to raise them in a Christian home. And Father, just to trust you to take care of their children, Father. And Father, we come to worship you, and that being part of the worship. But I pray that glorifies you. What we sing glorifies you as we look into your word and apply it to our lives, that it all glorifies you, Father. And we just pray that we would truly worship you, because you are worthy of our worship. You are greatly to be praised. And may we do just that this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, this is a special time in the life of our church, as we have parent-child dedication. And in this service, we have five families that are taking part of it. In the previous service, we had two families. So I think this might be the biggest child, parent-child education we've ever had. A uh, total of seven families. So if you're one of those families, would you come and join me down front? And y'all just kind of spread out along the, the front here. Uh, I told the camera people, I said, y'all got to get it real wide. We're going to have the whole front covered with families, which is a great thing to have. So y'all come on down. Isn't this a wonderful sight? See all these babies, all these young children, all these parents. All right, what a blessing it is to see these families come and be a part of this and uh, being a part of parent-child dedication. And so giving themselves to God as parents to dedicate themselves that they want to raise their children in a Christian home, but also giving their children to God to be used of God for his glory. And so uh, I want to introduce you to these families in case you don't know who everybody is. Now, as I said, we had two in the first service, but I'm going to introduce them at well. They're, they're actually, the first five families are here. The last two families I mentioned were in the first service, but we've got pictures of all the kids that will go up on the screen so you can see them. The first family I want to introduce to you is uh, Chris and Carrie Bowers, and uh, they have big brother Isaac with them. But uh, today they come dedicating Alan Michael Bowers. He was born November 22nd, 2019 at Duke Regional Hospital. And also they dedicate Lane Thomas Bowers. Jan born January 19th, 2024 at Duke Regional Hospital. So we're excited for them. 
But they're not the only Bowers family that's up here. We also have Jacob and Erica Bowers as well, and big sister Harper. Uh, and they come today dedicating their son, Mason Scott Bowers, who was born July 8, 2024, at Duke Regional Hospital. And we also have uh, Josh and Tracy Clayton right here, and they come dedicating their son, Joshua T Tate Clayton, born May 10th, 2024, at Duke Regional Hospital as well. And then we also have, I'm looking to see where everybody is, the Denny family also. Uh, this is Jacob and Rachel Denny, and they come dedicating their two children, uh, Mary Michael Jane Denny. She was born March 27th, 2020, at Duke Regional Hospital. And Jed Powell Denny, born July 6th, 2024, also at Duke Regional Hospital. And then we also have the Ellis family, and they, as Cody and Krista Ellis, and they're dedicating their daughter, Wren Evelyn Ellis, born March 22nd, 2024, at Duke Regional Hospital. And that's all the ones for this service, but I do want to introduce you to the, to the kids and the families of the, of the first service. And uh, we had Casey and Courtney Martin come in the first service and Big Sister Caroline, and they dedicated Creed Wayne Martin. He was born January 28th at 20, 2024 at Duke Regional Hospital. And we also had the Woodruff family, Clark and Casey Woodruff, and they dedicated Remington Lane Woodruff, born February 16th, 2023 at Duke Regional Hospital. I would say Duke Regional Hospital has gotten their money out of the families <laughs> of, of Red Mountain Baptist Church. So, uh, but this is an exciting sight to see all these families come and make this dedication today and, uh, and say, you know, we want to dedicate our children, we want to dedicate ourselves to the raising of, the children, uh, of, of these children in the way of the Lord. You know, it's a privilege as a church to encourage these parents and to assist these parents in the proper raising of their children. Because we do it together. It's not just them, but it's us and them together. And so it's appropriate for the home and the church to partner together and to unite together in dedicating all of ourselves to the raising of these children. You see, it's in this service that we first want to give thanks to God. Children truly are a blessing from God. And uh, I know it can be trying at times. I have three of my own that are all adults now. And so, um, but I'm thankful for children because children truly are a tremendous blessing from God. And I know these parents feel the same way. So we give God praise for the gift of these children that, that are standing up here and being dedicated. Secondly, we want to make a solid promise as parents, but also as a church, that depending on the grace of God and working as a church and a home together, we will seek to provide guidance and to these children and, and instruction and discipline and encourage them to trust Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life and then to grow in their faith. And finally, we want to pray God's blessing upon these parents and these children. I want to read to you from the scriptures that shows you that God desires that we raise our children in a Christian way, the word of God being an emphasis in that. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your home, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. So God desires for us to raise our children together this way, the home and the church. So that being said, I have a pledge for the church to make in just a moment, but first I'm going to have a pledge for these parents to make. So parents, in presenting your children to the Lord, do you promise that dependent upon God's grace and upon the partnership of this church to teach them the truths of the Christian faith, to set a Christian example before them, to bring them up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord, and to encourage them to accept Christ as the Lord and Savior under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Parents, if you so promise, would you please say, we do. Amen. Amen. Now, church, it's your turn. Do you as members of the family here at Red Mountain promise to join these parents in the teaching and the training of these children, that they be led in due time to trust Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and to proclaim Him in baptism and church membership? Church, if you accept this promise and these responsibilities, please respond by saying, we do. We do. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful and thankful for the gift of life. And we are so thankful for the blessing of children. And Lord, as we think about these children today and these parents, we are thankful. Their hearts desire as parents is to raise their children in a home where Jesus Christ is proclaimed. Where Christian values are taught. The word of God is taught. And Father, why it's not easy... Remind them they're not in this alone. They have us, their church family, to be here to help them, to guide them, support them, to partner with them in the raising of these precious gifts of children. Lord. And so Lord, we pray your blessing upon these children that you work in all their lives and get them to the point, at the right point, when you say it's the right point, Father, to give them the understanding, 
That they're a Savior who needs a Savior. I mean, they're a sinner who needs a Savior, Lord. And they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then you grow them to be the men and women of God that you want them to be. And they'll bring honor and glory to you. And they'll impact this world around you, Father. Father, bless this promise that these parents and, these, and this church is making today. That you would be glorified through it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before they head back to their seats, we have a certificate we're going to give them and, and, a, and a, a book for the parents and a Bible for each of the kids. So we don't head back until I give you a gift bag. So I'm going to, Isaac, if I can slide past you here, bud, I've got a gift for each family here. All right, so I'm trying to find everybody. So uh, there you guys go. Yep, sure thing. I'm just going to go down the line. And Rachel, I'm going to give you y'all's gift there. Sure thing. There you go. Yep. All right. There you are. I come around this way to you guys. There you go. All right. Let's celebrate them and congratulate them. Amen. <laughs> Y'all can head back to your seats. stand with me as we sing Everlasting God.
come to worship and praise that everlasting God that is so good to us, and we're so glad you're a part of that. And so God is just so good to us each and every day. As we come to this prayer time, just some things that we want to celebrate and give God praise for and then share some prayer requests with you. First off, I want to say congratulations to Jacob and Sammy Huff and their families. Jacob and Sammy were married yesterday. Let's celebrate them and congratulate them. Amen. <laughs> In case you don't know who that is, it's previously Sammy Watson, so uh, uh, just to fill you in on that. And then we had three wedding anniversaries this week, all fell on Monday, so Monday was the day this week, but we want to recognize these couples and just praise God for them and celebrate them. First off, congratulations to Jacob and Rachel Denny. They celebrate their seventh wedding anniversary on Monday. Let's congratulate them. Also on Monday, Bobby and Jen Show also celebrate their seventh wedding anniversary on Monday. Let's celebrate with them. And then one more for Monday. Eric and Crystal Prope celebrated the 35th wedding anniversary on Monday. And we praise the Lord for them also. Amen. And just, uh, we just want to give God praise for how he's working in people's lives. Uh, last week, Steve DeBlanc joined the church, so we're so thankful for what God is doing in Steve's life, and we give God praise for that. And then also, if you were here in the second service last week, you heard Lance Ellis give his testimony. What a powerful testimony. And we praise God for what he's doing in Lance's life, but also how God is already using that testimony to impact people's lives. I had some conversations with folks this week, and God is using Lance's testimony in a powerful way, so we praise the Lord for that. I do I want to share several things to be praying about or continue praying about. As you know, this Saturday is our fall festival, and so we just want to pray for our fall festival. The whole reason we're doing it is to reach out to our community. And so we want to pray for good weather. Check the weather this morning. Looks like we're going to have great weather this Saturday, so we thank the Lord for that. We just want to pray it stays that way. And just uh, pray, thank you, for, uh, for, praise the Lord for you guys showing up and helping out. Many of you signed up to serve. We still have some blanks to fill in. I'll address that at the end of the service, but uh, just uh, thank you for our people showing it up to help out with that, but we just pray for a great turnout from the community. So be inviting people to come, pick up those flyers, spread word on social media, spread word of mouth, do it that way. Uh, it's going to be this Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m., and so we had a great turnout last year, looking for a great turnout this year. And just pray the community will come and just uh, get a chance to meet them, but invite them to church. But more importantly, invite them to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. So we pray for eternal impacts through this fall festival this Saturday. And just give you some updates on folks we've been praying for. Uh, if you would continue praying for Laura's sister, Leanne Godley. Uh, Y'all been praying for her since she had uh, that cancer removed. And uh, she did meet with the doctors this week and got her plan for her treatment. Um, she's going to have 12 weeks of chemotherapy starting November the 12th. And then... <coughs> Excuse me. Followed after that will be six weeks of radiation, and then she'll be on medication for a number of years following that. So if you would continue praying for Leanne, it's going to be a very tough treatment for her. So just uh, continue praying for her, and thank you for praying for her. And we want to continue praying for Alyssa O'Brien and her family. Um, if you don't know what's happened with Alyssa, uh, Whitney had taken the kids and Tammy uh, down to Charlotte this week some, for some vacation. And while they were out and about, Alyssa had an episode where she uh, had to be taken to the local hospital found out she had a hole in her colon, and uh, she was life flighted to the Children's Hospital there in Charlotte and had surgery to remove part of her colon. And since then, she has had, um, I think it's three or if not four more surgeries. I'm trying to keep up. But uh, she's had some different things, and I talked to Whitney uh, before this service. And she had, Alyssa had surgery yesterday. And they had to remove all of her colon yesterday. So, um, it's been very tough on the family this week. As you can imagine, they've had to put Alyssa on the ECMO machine. And if you're not familiar with the ECMO machine, it's a form of external life support that does the work of her heart and lungs for her so her body can rest and heal. You may have heard that machine before because you remember years ago when Beth Chambers gave birth to Caleb Chambers, Caleb was put on that machine. And he was on it for a long while. But if you look at Caleb today, you would never know there was anything wrong with that boy. I tell you, the doctor said, well, he's going to have some long-term effects. He's got nothing. That's how good God is. And so we just want to pray that God will use this ECMO machine to let her body rest, 
to let her body heal and just pray um, that she doesn't need any more surgeries after this. Um, Whitney did say her numbers do look a little bit better today, so we're thankful for that. But uh, as you can imagine, the family is just flat exhausted. And so they've had a rough go at, since Wednesday. All this began on Wednesday. And so we're going to have a special time of prayer for them here shortly. Um, but remember them in your prayers in the days ahead. And just pray that, uh, that God would intervene. You know, I was telling Whitney, I said, you know, God is bigger than all this. And God has this under control. And God can do a miracle. And that's what we're praying for. He's got to do a miracle in, in young Alyssa's life. She's been through so much in her short time here on this earth. And so we just want to continue praying for Alyssa, if you would. <laughs> And then we want to continue praying for the victims of the hurricane uh, out in the western part of the state. Uh, we had two teams that were gone, and thank the Lord they have returned home safely this week. We praise the Lord for that. And, uh, you know, it's great to hear how God was using them, how God is working, how God is bringing good out of the midst of this devastation and tragedy in the western part of North Carolina. Um, if you're here Wednesday night, you heard Justin talking about uh, where they were. One of our teams is located just outside Asheville. And just the one location there where they're at, they have seen over 260 people give their life to Jesus. Christ. And so we praise the Lord for that. And that's just one of many, many locations throughout the mountains of North Carolina. So continue praying for God to work and to move in a mighty way. And then if you would pray for Jacob Denny. Jacob works for Piedmont Electric and he is, his crew is heading back up there tomorrow. They're being deployed back. He's already been up there once and came home for a little bit and now he's going back. And so... Um, so we want to pray that God will watch over them and protect them. Uh, the number of power outages is, is coming down, but uh, this is the type of what they're dealing with now is what they call onesies, where they have to go put up three, four, five, six poles to put power on one house. So it's going to be all these individual houses that are going to have to be done, and it's going to be a tedious job, so it's going to be a long job. So Jacob doesn't know how long he's going to be gone, but we want to pray for him, that God will use him there to impact people's lives, but also God will protect him and his crew and protect his family while he's gone. So remember Jacob Denny and his crew and then his family while he's gone as well. And, of course, we want to continue praying for the election. Uh, thankfully, it's almost over. Uh, you've heard me say many times I'm tired of the junk mail. I'm tired of the phone calls. I'm tired of the texts. I'm tired of the TV ads. I, I, look, I've already voted, and so I'm thankful that we have the ability to do early voting. And let me encourage you, if you haven't voted and you get a chance to do early voting, go do it. Uh, if you're in Pershing County, we just walked right in, you know, up there, that building there, Huck Sandsbury, and so encourage you to do it. And, and I say this with every election, and I mean it. I'm not pushing for any one candidate. Here's what I tell you. Vote biblically. Because no candidate is perfect. Every candidate has something wrong with their beliefs, with their, with their values, with their plan or whatever. But you take the word of God and the issues they stand on, see how that lines up with God's word. And that will tell you which candidate you need to be voting for. Jesus Christ is not running, so there is no perfect candidate. But we just got, look, God, I reminded the church of this Wednesday night, God is sovereign, God's over control of this election, and his, his will is going to be done, but we need to do our part to vote biblically. So I do want to encourage you to do that. So I'm going to pray for these things, but partway through, I'm going to stop and ask you to pray silently for Alyssa as we get towards the end of our prayer time together, and then I'll close this out. So let's pray together. Father, we are grateful and thankful that we can come and gather in the name of Jesus today and worship you, Lord God. And Father, we just give you praise for what has already happened here this morning. Father, we thank you for the first service and just seeing how you worked, but also those two families that took part in the parent-child education. And now this service has seen five families. Father, we thank you for these families and what you're doing in their midst. And, and Father, also the, the friends and the family that are here to watch us and be a part of that and, and what you're doing in their lives as well. And Lord, we just pray once again that you use us to partner with these parents to help raise these children to become great men and women of God. And Father, we just give you praise uh, for this wedding that took place yesterday. We thank you that Jacob and Sammy are finally husband and wife. I know they've been looking forward to this day. And Father, we pray your blessing upon their marriage, Lord, that you just would be honored and glorified through it. I know that's our heart's desire, and I know they want you to be the foundation of their marriage, so I pray that happens, Father. But Lord, use us to help them along the way as they grow in this new journey of their life. And Father, we thank you for these three couples that celebrated their anniversaries this week. We praise you for that and what you're doing in their lives, and we pray your continued blessing upon them, Father. And Lord, we thank you for just working in our lives all across the board. We thank you for working in Steve DeBlock's life and, and just uh, and seeing him join the church yesterday, making the, I mean, last Sunday, making the profession of faith. Father, what a joy it is to hear and see what you're doing in Lance's life, Lord, and for the testimony he shared last week and just how you're already impacting others through his testimony, Father. And we give you praise for that, Lord God. <coughs> And Father, we just uh, thank you for being so good to us. And Lord, we just pray for our fall festival this Saturday. Lord, we just pray that 
We would, it would have good weather like they're predicting. We pray, praise you for our folks that have signed up to help and, and more that will come and help, and we just have everything covered. But our community would come out in mass, Father, that we would, we would have the problem we had last year of, of running out of parking and having to park people in the field, Father. And so, Lord, I just pray that we have a great turnout, and we will have a lot of fun. But I pray ultimately there's a spiritual impact. We'll see people come to church because we got to meet them at the fall festival, and we'll see people's lives change for eternity because a seed was planted at the fall festival, Father. They'll come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And Father, we lift these other requests up to you. I pray for Laura's sister, Leanne. I thank you for being with her, Father, and now as she gets ready to embark on this long journey of this uh, treatment, Father, this chemo, this radiation, and all this medication she's going to have to take, Father, I just pray you encourage her, I pray you sustain her, and you strengthen her, Father, and just continue to touch her body and strengthen and heal her body, Father, and Lord, that you just would move in a mighty way in her life. And Father, we just pray for uh, the, the, the victims up in the mountains still of this hurricane. We thank you for the good that you're bringing out of this, the salvations that we're hearing about, Father. We thank you for the volunteers like our two teams that just came back last week and the work you're using uh, them to do up there, Father, to minister to people and to share uh, you with them, Lord. And Father, we thank you for the people that are continuing to be there and getting ready to go there. We think about Jacob and his crew getting ready to be deployed tomorrow to head back up there. So Father, we just pray for safety that you just watch her and protect him and his crew as they're up there working, continuing to restore power for, for these uh, people that have been without power for so long now. But Father, I know his desire is also to help and minister to people too. So I just pray you use him to do that as he prays for people, uh, maybe while he's working or even gets a chance to pray over people and talking with them, Father. But use him to make an impact and just bring him home safely, Father. Be with his family while he's gone. May you watch over and protect them also, Lord God. And Father, I just pray uh, for the election. Lord, I pray that you just let your will be done. May we as your people take each candidate, whether it's presidential, governor, or whoever else, and line them up with your word and see where they land. And we would vote biblically in a way that you're honoring and glorified. But we pray your will be done in this election, Lord God. And Father, right now, as we pause and pray for Lissa, may you be glorified in what you're doing there. May you work in a mighty way. So church, take this time just to quietly pray to the Lord and I'll close us out. Father, we thank you that you're a God of possibilities. When something seems impossible to us, it never seems impossible to you. Because as it says in Ephesians 3.20, you're a God who is able. You are able to do abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine. And Lord, we pray you do it in the life of Alyssa O'Brien. Lord, she's been through so much in this, this short time span, not even a week, Father. Multiple surgeries, having her entire colon removed, Father, and hooked up to this ECMO machine. Father, we just pray that you intervene, and if it's your will, that you heal her miraculously, because you can do it. And we pray that you do it, Father, if that's your will. Father, if it's your will to, to bring healing to her body through the gift of modern medicine, do that. And I pray that you continue to give the doctors and the nurses that are ministering to her and taking care of her wisdom and guidance as to what needs to be done, and to see things before they even happen, and to address them, Lord God. And Father, that you just would continue to watch over her and bring healing to her body, Father. And Father, I pray for Whitney, I pray for Brian, I pray for Hunter, I pray for the grandparents, I pray for the whole family, Lord. Lord, I know, just talking with Whitney so many times this week, how exhausted she is. And as she said this morning, it's like she's in a fog, Father, because she's so wore out. I pray you sustain them, Lord God. Strengthen them. Give them rest, Father. And when they do rest, give them good quality sleep, Lord. And Lord, give them peace that surpasses all understanding that you're going to take care of Alyssa. Father, you are the ultimate source of peace. You are the ultimate source of hope. And I pray they experience that right now. Right where they are, right this moment, they experience your presence like never before. That you just flood that room, that hospital room with your presence. And let them feel it in a mighty way, Lord God. They are encouraged. They are uplifted. And Father, they are flooded with peace that surpasses all understanding. And Father, continue to use us just to love on this family and care for this family and be here for them in the days to come. Whether it's a phone call or a text or a message sent through social media or even going down to see them in person, Father, because I know it's got to be tough being down in Charlotte, not being here at home in Rougemont. 
So, Lord, may we continue to love on them and care for them as our brothers and sisters in Christ, as part of this family here at Red Mountain, Lord. And, Lord, we pray you glorify yourself through all this and let people look back and say, we don't know what happened. All we can say is, look what God did. And we pray you get all the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Charles and Pat for reminding us how good God is to us with his forgiveness, with his mercy that we so desperately need in our lives. And what a wonderful blessing that is. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 4 in the Old Testament. We're uh, taking a break uh, from 1 Corinthians, our study in 1 Corinthians this morning as we celebrate uh, parent-child dedication. And so I was thinking about parent-child dedication and and thinking how tough it is to be a parent at times. Now, I know uh, we're all at different phases, and I'm in a different season in my life, and then all these families are down here. All my kids are adults now, so I'm, I'm getting older, and so uh, they're in a different season than I am. But I remember, and, and not saying it's not tough anymore because it's still tough. Y'all know with adult kids how tough it can be at times, but even with young kids it's tough at times. And, and so, but not everybody realizes that, not everybody understands that, and sometimes we forget that if we're in a different season in life. And so sometimes it's good to be reminded that, uh, that we need help, like we are talking about this morning. Help is the title of this message. Parents need help. 
Because sometimes we forget the help we need. And sometimes don't see, people don't see that parents do need help. And so uh, I came across this list. It's, it's called Miss a Motherhood. I think it was written uh, by somebody who maybe one part of it uh, forgot, one person forgot what motherhood's like or never knew it. And then you kind of have somebody that contradicts that is how it goes back and forth. So listen to some of these myths. Somebody said it takes about six weeks to get back to normal after you've had a baby. Now, somebody else responded and said, somebody doesn't know what you, once, that once you're a mother, normal is history. So there ever, there's a different type of normal once you have kids, isn't it? Somebody said, you learn how to be a mother by instinct. Somebody never took a three-year-old shopping. Isn't that true? Somebody said, being a mother is boring. Somebody never rode in a car with a teenager who, have a, who has a learner's permit. Boy, that's exciting, isn't it? So. Somebody said, good mothers never raise their voices. Somebody never came out of the back door in time to see their child hitting the golf ball through the neighbor's kitchen window. Somebody said, you don't need an education to be a mother. Somebody never helped a fourth grader with their math. Somebody said, a mother can find all the answers to her child-rearing questions in the books. Somebody never had a child stuff beans up her nose. Somebody said, your mother knows you love her, so you don't need to tell her. And then they write this, somebody isn't a mother. And how true that is. You know, being a mother, or for that matter, being a father is not always easy. It's tough at times. And as kids, you know, kids we don't always appreciate what their parents do for them. They don't always appreciate the sacrifices parents make. So that makes it even tougher at times. They don't always see what parents do for them. For example, here's a true story of that. Back in 1978, by a man by the name of Thomas Hansen out of Boulder, Colorado, sued his parents for $350,000 on the grounds of, now listen to this, malpractice of parenting. And here's what he said in the suit. Mom and dad had botched up his upbringing so badly that he would need years of costly psychiatric treatment. Now, I don't know who's at fault there, but when a parent is sued by their own kid, something's not right there, you know? Parenting is tough. And the good news is, parents, we don't have to do it alone, do we? Now, I realize we're all in different circumstances. We all have different support systems. But God does bless us with a support system to help us parent the children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or even maybe great-great-grandchildren because we're all in different phases to have an influence in their lives. You have your family to support you. You have friends to help you. You have your church family to be there to help you and support you. That's why I had the church pledge with these parents that we're going to come alongside you and we're partnering with you to help raise these kids because we need each other. But most importantly, if you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside you to help you. And you have the Word of God that God has given us to help us. And that's what we're doing this morning. We're looking at God's Word to find the help we need to be the parents we should be. Now this morning we are looking at the account of Eli and his two sons. Now if you're not familiar with Eli, the story of Eli and his sons is a story of disaster that's followed by years of compromise. Eli was one of the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. And as I said, he had two sons, and his two sons were priests for the nation of Israel. And all three men ended up dying on the very same day. And ultimately what led to their death was compromise. You see, when their father Eli is compromised on the clear instruction of God's word, he and his sons, but not just them, their families and even the nation of Israel suffered because of it. So with that in mind, if you're physically able, stay with me in honor of reading God's holy word. And let's look at these, first, the, uh, these verses here in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're beginning in verse 10 and reading through the end of the chapter. So, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and every man fled to his tent. There was, a great, <coughs> there was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. <clears throat> also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh where his clothes, with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise out of, of the outcry, he said, What does this sound of this torment mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? 
So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood, with, stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did, did not answer, nor did she regard, nor regard it. Excuse me. Then she named the child Ichabob, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured, and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. Father, as you look at this account of the life of Eli this morning, there's lessons we can learn from many people's lives, and here we learn from his mistakes. So I pray you take these lessons and apply them to all of our lives, not just parents, because we are all at different stages, but anybody, that's really all of us, that has influence over the lives of children. They may be grandchildren. They may be nieces and nephews. They may be someone in our Sunday school class. They may may be someone in the neighborhood or at the ballpark. But, Father, you have placed children in all of our lives so we can influence them. So may we take these lessons that you provide for us and see the help that you're offering us so we can have an eternal impact of the lives of the kids around us, Lord God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We can learn from Eli from what he did wrong. In this passage, there's three lessons I want us to look at, three lessons that we learn from his mistakes. Now, in these three lessons, we see that God offers us help when it comes to impacting the lives of children or, or maybe your grandchildren or great-grandchildren or if you're lucky enough to have great-great-grandchildren, you know, and that's, that we can influence our lives in such a way that God can work through us to have that influence on them that one day they come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then one day, God uses them in such a great way to bring honor and glory to himself. And they become great men and women of God. Now, before some of you tune me out, as I said in my prayer, this message is for all of us. It's not just for the five couples that stood down here or the two couples in the last service. And you may not have kids in your life biologically. But think about it. Somewhere in your life, there is a child that you can impact. It may be your neighbor. It may be in your Sunday school class. It may be when you teach children's church, like, like uh, those teachers are doing this morning. Did y'all see that herd of kids go out? I'm so thankful for that many kids. That's wonderful. You know, they have influence over those kids this morning. So whether you're a parent right now or not, or a grandparent or not, somewhere in our lives, we all have influence over a child somewhere. And we can take the Lord's lessons that God has given us this morning to help us to mold them and to shape them to be Christ-like. Now, let's just be honest. You know, just because you do this doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. It's going to be hard at times. When you do it God's way, it is hard at times. But having the Word of God to help us, that's what gets us through those hard times. And having each other, as we said earlier with these parents, you're not alone. You have the family of God here to help each other. We are doing this together to impact the next generation for the kingdom of God. So let's talk about these three lessons that we find here in this account of of Eli and his family in 1 Samuel 4. The first lesson I want you to learn and apply is this. Number one, don't give in to compromise. Don't give in to compromise. Now, you know, let's just be honest. Some things in life it's okay to compromise on. If you have a toddler that likes green beans but totally cannot stand the taste of broccoli, take the win and feed them green beans. You know, at least they're eating vegetables, you know. Don't force them to eat the broccoli. You know, that will come. You know, I'm eating stuff now as an adult I never liked as a kid, but I realize it's good for me. So it does come around, and we do get better. I'm not the best at it, but we get better, you know. So sometimes we have to compromise things like that, or sometimes things have to change as they grow up, and rules have to change. You know, when your child is four years old, you may want them to have that 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock bedtime, and that's fine when they're four. But when they're 16 years old, you may want them to have that 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock bedtime, but they want that 1 or 2 o'clock bedtime, don't they? And I'm not talking about p.m., I'm talking about a.m. And you've got to meet somewhere in the middle. You've got to compromise and saying you need to be home by such and such time. You need to be getting to bed at such and such time so you can go to school the next morning. Those things in life, it's okay to compromise on. I'm not talking about those things this morning. The things I'm saying don't give in to compromise on are the principle of God's Word. 
We don't need to compromise on what God's Word calls us to do when it comes to raising our children, when it comes to influencing the lives of the children around us. You see, Eli and his sons didn't get to where they were overnight. They just didn't all of a sudden jump deep into sin and say, here we are, and then all of a sudden the next day God killed them. That's not what happened, you know. They didn't wake up one morning and decide to immerse herself in a compromise and it happened that way. It was a period of little compromises and some big compromises along the way. Now it says Eli was 98 years old. He died as an old fella in the midst of this great disaster on that day. But he got there starting slowly years ago as he began making compromises in his life as we're going to see. So in case you're not familiar with the story of Eli and his two sons, let me kind of share with you or maybe refresh your memory if you are with it familiar with it. And we find a lot of background here in chapter 2. So if you want to flip back to chapter 2, you can. You don't have to. You can read it. I'm going to summarize it for you, basically. But I do want to point out verse 12 of chapter 2. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse, verse 12. It says this, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. That's not a good description of your child if you're a parent. You don't want God to say that about your child. If you have the, the Christian Standard Bible translation, it says it this way. Eli's sons were wicked men. They did not respect the Lord. So here's a description of Eli's son. These, these are guys who were corrupt. These are guys in God's eyes that were wicked men. And it says they didn't respect the Lord. It says they didn't know the Lord. So let's get some background on them. It tells us a lot about what these guys were doing wrong. See, back in that day, remember, they, they were priests. And the way that priests were taken care of is when people brought sacrifices to the tabernacle, when they brought it to the temple, a portion of that sacrifice would be set aside to take care of the priests. They would take the meat of that sacrifice, that portion, and they put it into a boiling pot, and they would boil that meat, and the priests would take a fork, and they stick it down in there, and they pull it out, and that would be their portion to eat. So they were taken care of. That's how God took care of the priests. That's what God had set up. That wasn't good enough for Eli's sons. They want to do something more. They, the roasted meat was not good enough for them. They just didn't want to have meat that was boiled. They wanted something better. So what they, start, excuse me, what they started doing was before the meat ever got in the boiling pot, they began taking off their portion of what they wanted. Oh, I want that filet. I want that T-bone. You know, they wanted something that they could cook the way they wanted to cook it, not the way God said to do it. They wanted something, a, a portion of meat that it was the best for them and to season it how they wanted it and to cook it how they wanted it. And that's what they began to do. They began stealing that from God, if you will, because God said that's not the way you do it. And so, you know, and they didn't hide doing this. They did this out in the open for all of Israel to see. So here's Israel looking to their, two of their priests, and here they are, they're stealing this portion of the sacrifice before they're even doing what God calls them to do. And over the years, through this process of compromise, Hophni and Phinehas became obsessed with physical satisfaction. But really what it was was, you know, they were, had a problem with a spiritual problem because they weren't trusting God. They were doing things their way. They were compromising on the way God said to do things, and they were, they were changing things around all for their selfish reasons. They were stealing from God, if you want to come down to that way. But that's not the only thing they did. As I said, they, they had the disdain for God, and they weren't shameful about this. They did this out in the open for everybody to see. They didn't care who saw, but can you imagine the impact that had upon the nation of Israel? But also, they corrupted, the Word of God tells us in chapter 2, they corrupted the servants of the temple. They got the servants of the temple to help with this thing and to do this thing for them. But it didn't stop there. Then they got involved in sexual sin. They slept with the women that would gather at the door of the temple. So here's two priests of Israel doing all these things. Over time, they begin to make decisions where they're compromising God's principle and getting away from where God wanted them to be. And the compromising sins of Eli's sons not only affected the people right around them, but they affected their father as well. Look again how, how it talks about the father there in verse 18 that we already read. And then it happened when he made a mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. Well, what does it mean that Eli was heavy? Exactly what you think it is. He was a big dude. Okay? Well, how did he get that way? He began doing what his sons were doing. He gave in to this temptation and compromised God's standard and God's way and began stealing the meat and eating what he liked. Maybe for all these years, he had done it God's way. He, he ate boiled roast, if you will, for, for days upon days upon days. But over there was his son, Hophni, on the grill cooking up that filet. And man, that thing smelled good. And Dad, you want to taste? No, I can't do it that way. That's not the right way to do it. 
But eventually he gave in. And he began doing it their way instead of doing it God's way. And for years of saying no, of this forbidden practice, he finally gave into that temptation and he eats that forbidden way of doing it for the first time. And then it continues and continues to say, what's the big deal? That's just something small. Yeah, the idea of big deals, that's no big deal. But little compromises lead into big compromises and it begins to snowball. And that's what began to happen. You see, by the end of his life, spiritually speaking, if you want to think about it this way, his heart was surrounded with the fat of sin. And he died a failure in the eyes of God. Eli had grown to enjoy the taste of sin. You see, little compromises here and there can have a major impact upon the life of our kids. For example, today you look around and you see parents and they give their kid a screen to watch. Phone, tablet, TV, whatever it is. And too many parents are using that screen as a babysitter. If I just give them that screen, they're going to be quiet and I can do what I need to do. And they just trust that what they're watching is okay. But how many parents truly monitor what their kids watch? How many parents truly monitor what their kids listen to? How many parents truly monitor what their kids are reading? And we just give them a screen and we plug them in front of that screen and say, hey, just watch this for a little bit while I go do this. And all of a sudden, all these messages from a very sinful, wicked world are being poured into their mind. The message is that gay marriage is okay. And they see images of, of drinking and drug use. They see images of transgenderism and extreme violence. And, and they learn from these, these shows they watch how to be disrespectful as parents, I mean to their parents, how to be disrespectful to authority figures. And then they start hearing messages that are totally anti-God. Messages and topics that will lead them far away from God and lead them far away from His Word because they're out there. They may be subtle at first. And let me tell you, they start young, friend. Don't wait till your kid's in middle school. They're hitting the elementary school kids, even the preschool kids. Oh, preacher, you don't understand. My kids watch Disney. That's okay. No, it's not. In case you don't know, Disney's putting out some very sick messages out there. Disney is not okay for our kids to be watching. Now, there's some things with Disney that are fine. That's why I say you need to monitor them. But Disney, and it's been documented in their board meetings, their goal was basically to take the mind of your child and put what their message into it, what they want them to think, that gay marriage is okay, that transgenderism is okay, and all sorts of other things. So don't just take the word of some company that says, hey, we've got your best kid, your, the intentions of your kid, you know, best intentions at heart and everything, we're going to watch your kid, everything like that. We as parents need to monitor what our kids are taking in because they start young trying to influence our kids. We can't compromise on things like that. We need to make sure they're hearing the Word of God. We need to make sure they're they're, they're, they're hearing how much God loves them and they're hearing what God has done for them and who God is and the Bible stories that go along with that. You know, if parents don't stay involved and monitor their children, what they're watching, what they're listening, what they're reading, friend, you need to watch out. Because over a period of time, it could be a very quick period of time, our kids are going to be in trouble. Now, be careful of what influences your kids. Let God's Word be the ultimate influence in your kid's life. Don't compromise on the principle of God's Word by letting them hear nothing but the messages of this world that's out there. You see, if your battle is between broccoli and green beans, hey, compromise all you want. But if your battle is between godliness and evil, sinfulness and righteousness, parents, hold your ground. Don't compromise. Don't give in to the pressure of the world. We as parents, we need to hold our ground and not give in to compromise. You say, Dave, you're out of that season of life. Your kids are all adults. Hey, look, I, I realize, you know, I'm not empty nester yet, but we're on, the way, way, we're on the way there. You know, I've got one kid in college. Emma's getting ready to start college. Seth's now engaged and everything like that. So I know we're going to be empty nester soon. But you know what? Even though my kids are adults and soon they'll be out of my house, I still need to have a godly influence on the life of my kids. And I will do everything in my power to do so. Now, I know that changes a little bit when they do move out of the house. And y'all know that, too, because some of y'all are already there. But it doesn't mean you just let go and say, okay, you're on your own. Figure it out. God still wants us as parents that have adult kids to hold our ground and not compromise. And here's the encouraging part. Friend, it's never too late to change. If we've been a parent who is compromising and has maybe plugged our kid in front of that screen for hours on end, letting them watch whatever comes up, today's the day to change. 
The easy thing to do is to compromise, but it's not the best thing for our kids. Think about how compromising God's principles, how compromising God's word will affect your kids down the line. Wait till they get to college if they've been compromised early on. Boy, you, thought, you think it's tough now. Wait till your kids get to college. And the majority of our colleges, even so-called Christian colleges that aren't truly Christian colleges, will seek to change the way your kids think. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't go to college because I think college is important. But you need to know where they're going. And you need to know what they believe. Now, there's a second lesson. Don't worry, the other two lessons aren't as long. There's a second lesson that we need to learn and apply. Number two, don't just talk, but act. Don't just talk, but act. In, in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, God sends a nameless prophet to Eli to get his family's act together. The warning comes because of love. God loves Eli. God loves his family so much that he sends someone to them and says, Look, Eli, there needs to be a course correction. If not, your family is headed for disaster. So the warning was an effort to get Eli to do something, to change this course that his family is on so they would not end up on this day of disaster that we read about in chapter 4. Eli heard the message. Eli told his sons, hey, what you're doing is wrong. But like a lot of parents, he didn't exercise his responsibility to act. When his boys wouldn't change their behavior, you know what he did? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. When all Eli did was talk and not act, the continued compromises led to more compromises, and eventually that led to that day of disaster that we read about in chapter 4. Eventually, God sent a hard message to Eli through the prophet Samuel. Remember when Samuel was just a boy, and Eli was kind of mentoring and taking him under his wing and everything like that? And, and, and Samuel was sleeping at night and going to bed and stuff, and he heard someone calling his voice. He thought it was Eli, but it was God. And God gave, gave Samuel a message that he didn't want to tell Eli because it wasn't a nice message. Let's read that. 1 Samuel 3, 12 and 13 say this. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity, listen, which he knows. Eli, you know this is going on in your household. It goes on to say this. Because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. In other words, Eli knew what was going on. And he did nothing about it. He was all talk but no action. See, if you're a parent, please consider this. Words of warning are not enough. Sometimes they are. Sometimes words of warning are enough, and and that will change your child's behavior. But sometimes they're not. God expects us to take action to correct the sin problems in the life of our children. If I see my adult kids living in sin... I'm not going to sit back and say anything and and do nothing and just say, you know what, they're grown, it's their decision. I'm going to say something. Why? Because I don't want them to end up like, like Eli's sons. I don't want them to go down that road. We must recognize, though, that even if you live a godly life, even if you raise them in godly principles, you know what it comes down to? They may not follow the ways of God. Some of us have children that maybe have done that. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Some of you have siblings that you and your sibling were raised in the same house and y'all are just polar opposites because of the choices in life that were made. You know, Samuel, that I mentioned earlier, Samuel eventually became a father himself. And ironically, his sons turned out just like Eli's. Samuel raised them in a godly way. And they made choices where they made bad decisions. When his sons had a chance to promote, be promoted to be key leaders of Israel, Samuel said, no way. The leaders of Israel said, look, your sons aren't living right. We can't make them leaders. And Samuel said, I agree. Let's not do, do it. So you just see, see, Samuel didn't just talk about it. He actually did something about it. He prevented them from being promoted to these leaders of Israel. Unlike Eli, Samuel never, Samuel never heard that dire warning from God's prophet because he didn't need to. Because he acted on it. Samuel had done his part. He had held his ground against compromise. It would have been easy to say, yeah, hey, you know, look at my sons. They're going to be the next leaders of Israel. Look how proud I am of them. But he didn't. He said, you're not living right with the Lord. I can't condone what you're doing. So you're not going to be the next leaders of Israel. He acted on it. Was it hard? I'm sure it was. I'm sure it grieved his heart to say that. But he was preventing a day of disaster in the life of his family like Eli experienced. God expects parents to be people, not just of words only, but also of action when we need to. Is all you do talk about what should be done, what God's Word says, but never put it into action? 
There's never an action behind what we say. Friend, if that's what we are, we need to change. Talk's not always enough. We need to put action behind what God calls us to do. And let's just be honest. Kids know when parents don't follow through on their threats, right? You know? Uh, Jimmy, if you don't do this, here's going to be the consequences. So Jimmy doesn't do it. Nothing happens. Jimmy, if you do this, here's the consequences. So Jimmy doesn't do it. Nothing happens. So what happens next time Jimmy has a decision to make? He's going to do what he wants to do because he knows dad or mom, they're not going to do anything. That's just the way we are as sinful beings. But when you have a parent who puts action behind their words, that changes the behavior of your child. Do we need to become a person of action today? Here's a final lesson we look at. Number three, realize everyone is responsible for their choices. Everyone is responsible for their choices. Both Eli and Samuel had surrounded their sons with the way to worship God, the way they were taught. They had surrounded their sons with the written words of Scripture. But by their own choosing, the sons, all four of them, Eli and Samuel's sons, headed in the wrong direction. Now, Eli's sons paid a terrible price for their sins. Remember, God allowed them to be killed. Samuel's sons might have been spared that same fate only because their father did something. The father would not let them be promoted to that position of leadership in the nation of Israel because of their sinfulness. No matter what society may tell you, friend, parents can have an influence in the lives of children. We can impact them. And no matter what society may tell you, not every problem your child faces is your fault, parent. Our society says, oh, that's just because of the way you were raised. Your mama didn't do this, your daddy didn't do this, or they did this, or didn't do that, or whatever it is. Now, I get, get it. Some things are passed on from parents, good or bad behavior. I get that. But we have to realize the decisions our kids make is their choice. And they need to face the consequences of their choices. It's their responsibility for the choices they make. Paul wrote about this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now listen. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Paul says, look, if you're, if you're reaping for the things of the flesh, you're going to reap nothing but corruption in your life. If you're reaping things of the Spirit of God and doing the things of the Spirit of God, God's going to bless your life. Our kids will reap what they're sowing. And even if we raise them right, even if we do everything we can to be a biblical parent and raise them by God's principle, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But we do the best we can. They still can decide to make bad choices. And sometimes they do. Let them reap what they've sown. And I love what he says there in verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Parent, don't get discouraged when your child makes the bad choice. Never give up. Keep on praying. Keep on speaking truth in their life. I know of a couple for over 20 years they've been praying for one of their, their children to turn their life around. After over 20 years, friend, they're beginning to see that prayer answered. They did not grow weary. They did not give up. And God's beginning to do work because of over two decades of praying for their child. That child is now beginning to make changes. Friend, that's the power of God. But I'm thankful for these parents that have not given up for over two decades praying for their child. So don't give up. We can't do everything right. Our children will make wrong choices. And that's when we come alongside them and we show them the choice they made was wrong. And, they, and we try to help them make right choices next time. But please, please, please let them deal with the consequences. A problem we have in our society, all across society, is we keep on bailing our kids out. Oh, little Jimmy, he's so perfect. He didn't mean to slap his teacher in the face. She must have said something that provoked him, that's the teacher's fault. It's not Jimmy's fault. You know, some of y'all are school teachers. Some of y'all have dealt with those parents. Well, their kid's perfect. You know, their kid can walk on water. You know, there's no perfect kid. But sometimes we think our kid's perfect, don't we? And we bail them out, we bail them out, we make excuses, and we, and we keep on bailing them out so they don't get in trouble. Friend, we're not helping them. Let them face the consequences 
of their choices. I guarantee you they're going to be better off when they're adults if you teach them that way when they're young. They're responsible for the choices they make. We need to realize that we're all responsible for the choices we make. And I get it. It can be hard to watch a child make wrong choices. And don't think that because my kids are preacher kids, they have always made the right choices. My kids have made plenty of wrong choices. And we've done everything we best to let them reap the consequences of their choices. I'm not a perfect parent. I make mistakes. They're not perfect children. They make mistakes. You say, well, your kids aren't here. You would be saying, if they were all sitting right there, I'd be saying it right now. No kid is perfect. They're going to make wrong choices. And it's hard to watch your kid go through the consequences. But friend, trust God to work through it. Because God can take those consequences and they can, God can use those consequences to work in your child's heart and turn their life completely around, 180. We've seen that so many times in Scripture, haven't we? Where, where somebody in Scripture has made a terrible wrong choice and God let them deal with the consequences and then God turned their life around. Think about King David. You talk about someone that really messed up, committed adultery, Started with lusting after Bathsheba across the way. Had her come over to his place. They committed adultery together. And then he committed murder. Murdered her husband. Read the whole account. It wasn't just his husband that died. When he sent word to pull back from Bathsheba's husband, other soldiers died as well. David committed, committed multiple murders. It wasn't just Bathsheba's husband. But it was other innocent people. The husband was innocent. And yet what happened with David? Psalms 51 talks about David's repentance. David for a while lived in his unconfession. Until God sent Nathan the prophet. And basically Nathan pointed at David and said, you're the man. Told him a story about, you know, and got his attention. David was so mad. And, and, and Nathan said, that's you. That's how you're behaving. That's how you're acting. And God gripped David's heart, and he turned around. And so much so, how does the Bible describe David? There you go. A man after God's own heart. God can do the same for us. God can do the same for our kids. And he wants to do it. Throughout history, millions of people's lives have been changed by the goodness of God. You heard earlier Charles and Pat saying about his forgiveness and his mercy. That's the God we're talking about. Let God work in the life of your child. But it has to start with letting us let God work in our life. Are we letting God work in our life? What needs to change in us as parents, as grandparents, as aunts, as uncles, as just an adult that can influence the life of a child? What needs to change so that we can raise our kids to be godly men and women? Maybe these are some things that we need to change this morning, these three lessons. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's something else God's pointing out to you. But let me encourage you to make that change this morning. God's providing the help we need. The question is, are we going to take it? You don't have to do this alone. But God has entrusted you with that precious gift, your child or your children, and he wants us to handle them correctly, to handle them biblically. And maybe the way that needs to happen is the first step in your life is you need to trust Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Have you ever made that decision? Maybe today you just need to turn from from your sinful ways and believe in who Jesus is as God's son, that he paid the penalty of your sins so you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. If you ask him, he'll forgive you. That forgiveness that Charles and Pat sang about, he'll pour mercy into your life that they sang about, and he'll give you the gift of everlasting life. Maybe that's where you are today. Friend, God is here to help in any situation, not just parenting situations. It's time that we call out to him and ask for help. Father, we thank you that your word is so true to life. None of us are perfect parents or perfect grandparents or aunts, uncles, or whatever. But you're a God who's merciful. You're a God who's gracious. You're a God who wants to help us to be people of influence to the next generation. And so, Lord, we think about children this morning because of parent-child dedication. But you have given us a responsibility to raise them right. It's not just on the parents, it's on all of us. We are a community brought together to help raise these children, the body of Christ. So Lord, 
may we all examine our life this morning to see if we're lining up with your word. To see if there's something we need to change to, to be that person of influence, whether it's a parent, grandparent, Sunday school teacher, neighbor, whatever it is, that we can influence the next generation so they will become men and women of God that will live their lives for you. And Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, may they make that decision this morning. Lord, I'll be down at the front. I'd be glad to talk with and pray with anybody as we sing in just a moment here. But whatever it is we're doing, may it bring honor and glory to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. As we sing, you respond as the Spirit of God is leading you this morning. <laughs> Yes, we are so thankful to the Lord that you're here and uh, just a privilege to worship with you. But we do want to get in touch with you, connect with you. So take a moment, fill out the connect card, take it to the welcome center. There'll be someone there at the desk to give you a gift, say thank you. But we're glad you're here and we do want to be in touch with you. And as I mentioned, our fall festival is Saturday. So thank you all for, for inviting people. If you haven't invited people or need to invite more, there's more flyers in the foyer, in the welcome center. Take them, pass them out, word them out, social media, whatever. It's Saturday from 1 to 3 here at the church. It's mainly going to be set up on this side. Uh, out front and all the way back and everything. We're going to have parking on the rest of the area. Um, and speaking of parking, let me go ahead and say this. We're asking our folks to park in the field. So uh, you're going to be able to go in between that yellow chain link fence and the first crepe myrtle. We're going to pull up those landscaping timbers and we're asking our folks to park in the field. Obviously, if you have trouble walking, park up close. That's no problem. But if you have no trouble walking, please park in the field. We want to let our guests park on the gravel. As I said, uh, I can't remember if I said in this service, but last year we ran out of parking and we ended up putting people in the field last minute. So we're going to go ahead and alleviate that problem, let our guests park on the gravel. But if you haven't signed up to help out, there's still ways you can serve. There's some, still some, some blanks over there on the, on the seat where you can sign up and serve for a half hour in a different area. And then you can enjoy the rest hour and a half and just have a good time with your family. But we're looking forward to this. So hopefully you'll come out and support that and bring someone with you. I want to remind you that there's still some out there, the blessing bags that are out there in the, in the Welcome Center. Go by, pick some up. This is a great opportunity to put them in your car when you see a homeless person or someone one in need, give it to them, pass it out, and it's a blessing to them. There's, you know, hygiene items in there, there's water, there's some nabs, and most importantly, there's a track of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so they can have that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, the other week, I, I picked some up on Thursday, I picked up four bags on Thursday, and Em and I were going down Friday for a doctor's appointment, and, and I was paying attention to traffic, and she saw a guy over there in the corner, she said, Dad, you got one of those things. You know, I've been married long enough that I'm supposed to know what that thing is. You know, but I didn't know what that thing was, so I asked, you know, and she said, the bag thing. I said, yeah, they're right there in the back seat. So she gave it to this guy. He had just gotten out of the hospital, and he was, he was, had nothing. You know, he'd been in the hospital and just sitting on the side of the road with nothing, begging for help. And he was so appreciative that, that a church would put a bag together with him in mind, that they would think about him. The next day, I was up at Walmart, and just pulling out of Walmart, there by the gas station was a family with a sign in need. 
And I went by them, and, and I tell you, as soon as I hit that 501 and cut right, the Holy Spirit just grabbed hold of my heart and said, go back and give them every bag you got. And so I did. And again, they were so appreciative. And look, it's not up to judge, for us to judge if they really need it or not. They're asking for help, and this is a way that we can meet a physical need to ultimately meet a spiritual need in their life. So hopefully today, that box will be empty of bags. Go by and pick up as many as you want to give out and give them out this week because there's a lot of people in our community that have been forgotten about because they are homeless that need Jesus Christ as well. And then I want to make you aware about something we're starting back up on November the 17th before COVID. You know, COVID messed up a lot of things, and this is one of them. We were meeting with our sister church across the street, New Red Mountain Missionary Baptist Church, a couple times a year doing services, and, and we're starting that back up. So we're starting back up the community Thanksgiving service on November the 17th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They've invited us to come over there, and they're going to feed us a Thanksgiving lunch. So don't go home and eat lunch. Come over there at 2 o'clock, eat lunch. And then after the lunch, we're going to go upstairs to their, to their sanctuary. We're going to have a worship service. I'll be preaching that afternoon. So I hope you'll come. That's on the 17th at 2 o'clock across the street with our sister church, New Red Mountain Missionary Baptist Church. So put that on your calendar. And then fun bunch, want to make you aware about a trip you're taking on December 10th to the Ruby Theater in Selma. And uh, that's you're going to go see the Christmas Jubilee Show. Uh, the tickets are $33 a piece. If you're interested in going, you can sign up in the Welcome Center. You're going to eat lunch before the show somewhere there in the area. Um, but go ahead and sign up if you're interested. A number of you already have. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can see Pastor Cameron when he gets back. He'll be glad to answer those questions for you. And then finally, I just want to remind you about the shoebox ministry, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, a number of you have picked up boxes. A number of you have already bought them, brought them back. Our goal is to surpass what we had last year. I don't remember the exact number, but if you go look at the picture in the Welcome Center, there's tables with tons and tons of shoeboxes on them that you guys brought in last year. And so if you haven't picked up a shoebox, there's still a few back in the display back here, but the majority of them on the table over here that you can pick up, put together, and then just fill them. I want to remind you just a couple of things like Pastor Cameron has. Um, this is the only box that child will get their entire lifetime. So they don't get one every year. So make it a quality box. And you can do things like take the, take the stuff out of the packaging. If it's a toy, take it out of the packaging so there's more room to put more stuff in. But also, so you're not you're leaving them with a bunch of trash to deal with because we don't know how they deal with trash where they are. And then there's a $10 shipping cost that Operation Christmas Child, you know, asks us to help pay. So if you go online and pay that, we just need to know. So put a little note in the box. Or if you need help, you can see Ashley Crabtree or you can see Jennifer Taylor. They'll be glad to help you out with that. But most importantly, pray over your box or your boxes. Pray for that child that received the box, their family, their village. Because God, if you saw the video last week, uh, we'll have another one next week. God can take one box and use it to impact the lives of many people. So pray for whoever will receive your box. So we're going to encourage you to do that. At this time, Justin's going to come with something he'd like to share with you. Good morning. Last uh, week, we took up a love offering for Pastor Dave and Pastor Cameron. Um, Pastor Cameron's not here. He's on uh, vacation. So I guess uh, Dave will get his cut out of everything, being he's not here to participate. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's truly a blessing to have Pastor Dave and Pastor Cameron, <clears throat> excuse me, as a leadership. Um, we have seen phenomenal growth, um, both in good times and bad. Um, he has challenged us. Um, both he and Cameron have um, put us in places that we never thought of or never heard of before. Um, so it is a privilege and an honor to uh, present Dave, and uh, I'll get Cameron his later on. Um, our, our appreciation to you guys. We love you. Thank you all so much, uh, and to God be the glory. And we give him all the glory for what he's done. And uh, I truly, I say this often, I, and I truly, truly mean it. It's not just a, a cliche, but it's a joy to serve as your pastor. And I love you all dearly. I know you love me and my family. That's been evident. And, uh, and it will, you know, just with the 20th anniversary celebration, I can't believe it's been 20 years and now in the 21st year. And, and uh, God's been good. But uh, it's such a joy to serve as your pastor, but to serve alongside you for the kingdom of God. So thank you for honoring us this way. Thank you for your generosity in this love offering. And just to, to God be the glory. And I'm going to ask Justin to come and close us in a word of prayer. 
Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house and worship you, Lord, and thank you for this message. Lord, thank you for the outpouring of the children dedication, Lord. We just pray that you be with those families and we are able to rally around them and support them in any efforts that we see fit. Lord, we just pray that uh, you just watch over us this week. We just be, just be with all those on our prayer list, Lord. Um, we just pray for Alyssa. and her family. Lord, may we lift up our pastors also in our prayer and our quiet time. May you lead us in the way that you want us to go in your son's holy precious name. Amen.